Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, what happens when you donate your body to science, and how do you do this? As you yeah, probably might expect, the rules surrounding how one goes about donating one's body to science varies a little from region to region, though the general process and what happens after you donate seems to be relatively consistent. For instance, in the United Kingdom, donating one's body typically involves nothing more than filling out a few forms provided by your nearest university or medical school. Under British law and the Human Tissue Act of 2004, written and witnessed consent is required prior to death for a medical authority to claim a body, and it's highly recommended that you make your family aware of your wishes to expedite the process of transporting your body after death. The latter is important as it is not possible in the UK for your next of kin to override your final wishes in regards to organ and body donation, and just in general, it's a really good idea to process your body lest it get rejected for not being, for lack of a better phrase, fresh enough. Speaking of organ donation and body rejection, in most cases being an organ donor whose organs are harvested will disqualify you from subsequently donating your body to science directly, though there is a potential loophole in the United States in going through a body broker, which we're going to get to in a moment. However, it is possible to be both a body and organ donor simultaneously, regardless of what side of the pond you're on. In the event your organs are deemed unsuitable for transplantation, the relevant medical authority you've willed ownership of your body to can choose to take your body or not at their discretion. On that note, while there are no universal rules for what condition your body has to be in at the time of death for a medical authority to be able to make use of it, a number of things can exclude you immediately from being considered. For instance, you'll almost certainly be disqualified from donating your body if you die of a communicable illness or anything that doesn't have a known cause but which may be communicable. In fact, among the first things done to donated bodies beyond refrigerating them to slow decomposition is to test them for any infectious diseases. After this, the body will typically be embalmed, although there are exceptions to this, such as if it's being used for a study on how the body decomposes naturally over time in certain scenarios, as is sometimes done with CSI training or investigation. Another way your body will usually be disqualified is if you die in a manner which renders it in any way abnormal. So, for example, if you die in a severe car crash or from a disease which wastes away your organs or muscles, it may be rejected due to the fact that institutions accepting bodies usually only want cadavers that are representative of a healthy adult. As one source puts it, in a way to successfully donate your body, you have to be in perfect health but dead. But again, there are always exceptions, and for example, researchers wanting to study some disease or the effects of a given car crash may be interested in your body, just particularly in the latter case, that can be hard to arrange beforehand. Even if your body is relatively unscathed at the time of your death, if you die under mysterious or suspicious circumstances and an autopsy needs to be performed, there's a good chance this too will result in your body being rejected. Other things that can result in your body being rejected, according to a non-exhaustive list provided by the University of Liverpool include bed sores being present on your body at the time of death, dying of an aortic aneurysm, and being obese. Your body could also potentially be rejected if the relevant medical authority simply has no room for any more bodies, or you happen to die at a time of year when nobody is around to study your corpse in a relatively timely manner, such as during the holidays in late December. It's also important to note that in the event your body is rejected, the medical authority you willed it to will take no responsibility for your body's disposal, and the relevant funeral costs will thus fall to your estate. On the other hand, if your body is accepted, the medical authority studying it will often, depending on the wishes of you or your family, cremate the remains free of charge or otherwise return them to your family for a private service at your own expense. Interestingly, because medical institutions potentially cover the costs of the disposal of your body, a not insignificant number of Britons have relatively recently started to opt in to donating their body to science in the hopes that if their body is accepted, their loved ones won't have to pay any expensive funeral costs. In Britain, this is a pretty significant expense. In 2016, it's estimated that the average funeral cost £3,702, which is about $5,000. Now let's hop over the pond. In the United States, the criteria for donating a body to science is basically the same, and they require you to sign a few forms signaling consent prior to death. And again, it's a good idea to inform your family of your wishes in regards to body disposal, because as in the UK, the ultimate decision of what happens to your body rests with your kin. 
As the Forensic Anthropology Center of the University of Tennessee puts it, regardless of what you have arranged, signed, or instructed, your family or next of kin has the final say. We will not fight your family for your body. We urge you to convince your family that the donation is what you want at your death. Also, like in the UK, certain factors can render your body unsuitable for study, and for the most part, they're fairly comparable. Death from extreme trauma, infectious disease, and certain cancers can all cause your body to be rejected, as can being obese. On that note, most medical institutions in the United States place a height and weight limit on the cadavers they'll accept. Usually limited to 6 feet, that's 1.83 meters, and a max of between 180 and 200 pounds, that's 82 to 91 kilograms, depending on the medical institution. The main reasons for these restrictions are practical in nature, with it being noted that transporting obese bodies is more difficult, and the medical tables typically used aren't large enough to accommodate pleasantly plump corpses, or those who are very tall. On top of this, dissecting obese bodies is more difficult, owing to having to slice through a lot of fat to get to what's being studied. Having organs and arteries and the like a bit more accessible, thanks to low body fat percentage, is just easier to work with. Or, as Louisiana State University professor Stephen Helmsfield very frankly states, when you're doing medical dissection and you're up to your elbows in fat, it's greasy and unpleasant. In the UK, no such height limit is explicitly specified in any literature we could find, although especially large persons are advised that their bodies might be rejected, with the common reason listed being difficulty in moving the body. Unlike Britons, thanks to competition for bodies being stiff in the States, petite American citizens have a great deal of choice when it comes to donating their body to science. And if you're wondering why competition is stiffer in the US, well, other than the greater number of institutions needing bodies, only a small fraction of the 100 million or so people who opt into organ donation end up opting into alternatively donating their body to science. This is despite full body donation arguably being just as beneficial as organ donation, if not more so in some cases, in that the benefit to science can potentially help many people, instead of just a maximum of a handful as in organ donation. And it's important to note that as with organ donation, a single body can and often is used for several research projects. As the Associate Director of Education at Indiana University School of Medicine, Ernest Telerico notes, you literally help tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands with a donation. It's not only those who learn from you, it's also the research and those who learn from the research. Because of the high need for bodies, some companies in the US have made a fortune acting as a middleman of sorts between families and scientific institutions. Said companies generally offer to pay the costs of cremation and the transportation and storage of the body to and from wherever it is needed. For instance, ScienceCare has taken the idea to its logical extreme, comparing themselves to McDonald's in that they deliver a product, in this case human bodies and body parts, of a consistent quality, regardless of where the institution wanting the body or body part is in the country. In fact, it's reported that from 2012 to 2014 alone, ScienceCare brought in a cool $12.5 million selling human remains, which is only publicly known due to certain court filings. Another body broker, Research for Life, notes that they typically get about $2,500 to $3,000 profit per full body. As for gross cost, documents from another body broker, Biological Resource Center, showed that they were charging $5,893 per whole body in 2013, but could potentially make more if slicing the body up. For instance, they listed a price of $1,900 for a spine, $3,500 for a torso, and $1,300 for a leg. One of the main controversies with such for-profit body brokers is that it's not clear how many of the people signing up to them realize these companies generate income by selling body parts or whole bodies from those who donated their deceased selves to the companies. To be fair though, it should be noted that, at least in the case of science care, their donor consent form does explicitly state the for-profit nature of the company. And for those wanting to increase the odds that their family won't have to shell out any money for disposing of one's remains, companies like these do offer a reasonably good outlet. As previously noted, some body brokers also allow you to donate your organs first, and then they take the rest of you to sell off at their discretion. With most all of these companies, though, you just have to understand that what happens to your body after they get it isn't generally something you or your loved ones have much say in. For instance, certain of these organizations have taken advantage of the fact that there is little in the way of oversight in the body donation industry, unlike organ donation, which is regulated. This means they've sometimes used bodies in ways explicitly against the wishes of the deceased when they filled out the paperwork. 
Other such companies simply note right there on the application form that they can't be sure what your body or body parts will ultimately be used for. So, as with everything in life, even in death, if you're getting a product for free, odds are reasonable you're the product. It's just that, in this case, the old adage is a little more literal than usual. Some people, of course, have a huge problem with such for-profit body broker companies, while others are just happy to maximize the odds of their loved ones not having to pay for an expensive burial or cremation, caring little about what's done with their corpse. Moving swiftly on, whether donating to a medical institution directly or to a body broker, there's a wide range of career options available to the discerning corpse, not just in giving medical students incredibly valuable practice working on a human body that doesn't care if they screw up. As for these dead body career options, doctors may use your body to train in some new and innovative surgical method or with some new piece of equipment. Being able to use your corpse for this can be a huge benefit in reducing the risks of mistakes when operating on the living. A somewhat more exciting cadaver career path can be found at the University of Tennessee's Forensic Anthropology Center, where they have been watching bodies decompose in various ways for about three decades. If you live within 200 miles and they accept your body, they'll even transport it for free. One of the many ways in which they might use your body is to mimic various ways in which people are murdered and then just observe the effects on your body, possibly even over the span of many years. They may also use a living picture of you to observe the change in your appearance as you decompose in order to help them figure out how a given corpse probably looked in life. This and many other experiments provide incredibly valuable data to a variety of fields, most notably, in this case, crime scene investigation. If being murdered after you die and then closely observed as you rot away isn't your thing, when you donate your body, some institutions allow for selecting to donate to safety testing. While this might seem a bit bizarre if you've never heard of it before, the use of dead bodies in car safety testing is something every car manufacturer benefits from when testing some new safety device or a car design. However, it does seem that when asked, most manufacturers seem to outright deny that they test this way. Now, for some, it's technically true that they don't, in that they may simply donate funds to various medical institutions that, in turn, at the behest of the company and the National Highway Traffic Administration, use bodies to test their cars and their safety equipment. This means it's not technically the car company doing it, but come on. Depending on the nature of the deal, the data collected may be available to all car companies and the public, or in some cases, such as with Ford's inflatable seatbelts, the information may only be shared with the company and the National Highway Traffic Administration. In these proprietary cases, the information is declared by the company as confidential business information. This means the information is not available even through a Freedom of Information Act request. Perhaps gruesome to some, the use of your body in this way can potentially save thousands of lives, as no artificial crash test dummy perfectly mimics the human body like, well, a human body. As former Ford safety researcher Priya Prasad notes, even though we have very good math modeling of dummies, human modeling hasn't reached that state yet. For anyone wondering here, we did check, and as far as we can tell, neither Ferrari nor Lamborghini offer such a program. Now, this could mean that they don't do it, or like the example previously, they just pay someone who's not technically them to do it. Either way, given the number of non-sports car models produced is much greater than the blazing fast variety, keep in mind that if you opt to have your body used in safety testing and you're selected for crash testing, your corpse will probably end up stuck in a rather boring family car. Beyond crash tests, there are countless other ways in which your body might be used if you opt for safety testing. This includes testing various helmet types. In fact, some dead people's heads are presently being used to design better helmets for those who participate in American football. As you might imagine, the NFL is particularly interested in this line of research, but it's also potentially massively beneficial for the many thousands of teens who play the sport. In the end, if something is used to protect a human in some way and it's made by a major corporation, odds are strong that at some point said device was tested on dead people, generally via grants given to medical institutions who actually have access to these bodies. If having your head put in prototype helmets and bashed up against hard surfaces or having your body involved in a minivan crash isn't your thing, there is another slightly more badass sounding option. This would be to donate your body to a medical institution and opt to have it used by the military. If accepted, your body will likely be loaded with state-of-the-art sensors and then used to help test new weapons and armor, or just used in testing things like a given explosive's effect on a human body. Yes, if you'd like to help protect the troops or help in the design of making weapons for making more bodies, you too can potentially have your corpse blown up for military science. 
Or if you're more of a pacifist, you could have the option to spend the afterlife as a skeleton, but not like any other skeleton, a skeleton examined by countless researchers. Yes, there are numerous anthropology departments across the world who can take your body and strip it down to such for study and research. In these cases, of course, your skeleton will likely not be cremated or otherwise returned to your loved ones. On this note, the University of Tennessee currently boasts an impressive collection of around 1,000 full human skeletons. They note, every individual donated to the skeletal collection is used to educate, train, and provide a resource for research in forensic taphonomy. And for the extreme exhibitionists among you, it's even possible to donate your body, or at least part of it, to be put on public display. Besides the famed Body Worlds exhibition, the Mata Museum in Philadelphia is one option for such. So to sum up, whatever you'd like your body to be used for when you're done with it, donating your body to science is simply a matter of first contacting a relevant authority or institution, usually your local medical school is your best bet. Though if you just want the free body disposal and don't care about what's done with your corpse, a body broker isn't necessarily a bad option. Either way, you'll then only need to fill out a quick few forms to signal your consent in order to make it happen. And it's also best to explicitly mention to your loved ones that those are your wishes in order to make sure that things go smoothly after you die. Also, for most every option, you should generally plan that your estate may need to at least pay for transportation of the body, and also the possibility that your body may be rejected when the time comes, meaning funds for a more traditional body disposal will be needed. And hey, if your body is accepted and the institution chooses to go ahead and handle all the fees, that's just extra money freed up for use by your loved ones to throw a better party in your honor with. And now for some bonus facts. It's speculated that the likely reasons for the large disparity between people opting into organ donation versus full body donation in the United States is that donating one's entire body is somewhat stigmatized, which is the opposite of organ donation, which is celebrated. Further, arranging to donate your body to science requires slightly more effort than just checking a box on a form when renewing your driver's license or the like. Further, the average American male simply has a body outside of the height and weight range typically accepted by most medical institutions. That's a max of 180 to 200 pounds and being six feet tall. For reference here, the average adult American male rings in at about 195 pounds and five feet 10 inches tall. That's 1.8 meters, according to the CDC. Given that this is more the norm than the more physically fit bodies many medical students and doctors practice on, there has been some call of late to start accepting bodies with a bit more girth and height, so said medical students will end up getting more first-hand experience with the type of bodies they're likely to frequently work on in their career. However, the practical side of things still rules the day at present, though many institutions are starting to transition to bigger tables and particularly loosening their guidelines on weight restriction on accepted bodies. As the aforementioned Professor Hemsfield states, I don't think you need a room full of obese cadavers, but I still think there's a usefulness for students. I think to give them a sense of what the effects of obesity can be on a person's body, there's nothing like the real thing. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also some videos from the archive over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.